movie. What it is, is 450,000 years. Well, a lot has happened since my modest little climate change film, An Inconvenient Truth or Convenient Fiction, came out a year ago. Al Gore won an Academy Award, and also some obscure prize from a committee over in Norway. Is there anything left for him to win? Well, better keep your eyes on Denver in late August. Late in the year came the news that the Arctic ice cap had shrunk to an area smaller than ever before seen in the last few decades. A story that scared hundreds of scientists and thousands of journalists, guaranteeing repeat headlines in the media. But right after the first of the year, however, it became apparent that the planet was undergoing a sharp and unexpected cooling. The largest in 30 years, it turned out. Now, one year does not a trend make, but a few more cool years and there might begin to be a crisis in climate alarmism. Well, the Arctic ice cap wasn't the only thing that shrunk last fall. After the New York Times politely called me Big Boned in their article about my film, I decided that maybe the Times isn't always wrong and so something needed to change. I thought about following the example of Gore and the Hollywood crowd and buying calorie offsets. You know, have someone else lose weight for me. But I realized that I had to do it the old-fashioned way, by giving up my Fred Flintstone Homer Simpson diet for the Bruce Jenner diet instead. And so now, 45 pounds lighter, I am ready to take up where I left off last year. I've even offered to sell my calorie offsets to Al Gore. He looks like he could use some these days. Good thing I've been lifting weights too, because you need some brawn to cope with the heft of the IPCC's fourth assessment report on climate change that came out in drips and drabs in the second half of 2007. Lately I've been wading through the 900 page report of Working Group 1 on the science of global warming. Now it's a funny thing, for a scientific matter that is supposedly settled, this report admits of a lot of things that we don't know very much about. For example, the report uses the word uncertain or uncertainty 1300 times in 900 pages and still describes our level of scientific understanding of many key aspects of climate as either low or very low. For example, here's page 601. Nevertheless, models still show significant errors. Significant uncertainties, in particular, are associated with the representation of clouds and in the resulting cloud responses to climate change. Consequently, models continue to display a substantial range of global temperature change in response to specified greenhouse gas forcing." Close quote. That doesn't sound like something that's fully settled and nailed down to me. Meanwhile, I have been pondering the popular proposal that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent by the year 2050. I call this the 80 by 50 target for shorthand and I've been doing some calculations about what it actually means. Now one problem with this whole subject is that it involves a lot of large numbers that make the eyes glaze over. For example, according to the most recent data from the Department of Energy, the U.S. emits about 6 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide, the principal greenhouse gas. Achieving an 80 percent reduction will mean that by the year 2050 we'll need to emit no more than about 1 billion tons of CO2. Well, those are large numbers that are hard to get your hands around. What does this mean in real terms? We'll start with this question. When was the last time the U.S. emitted 1 billion tons of CO2 from fossil fuels? From historical data, it turns out that the year the U.S. last had that emissions level was 1910, the tail end of the horse and buggy era. But in 1910, remember, the U.S. only had about 92 million people. By the year 2050, if the Census Bureau's projections are accurate, our population will be around 420 million people, which means that on a per capita basis, we'll each have to have much lower emissions than our great-grandparents did in 1910. Right now, the U.S. emits a little less than 20 tons of CO2 per capita. But to meet the 80 by 50 target, per capita emissions will have to be reduced to about 2.5 tons per capita, an emissions level that the U.S. last experienced way back in 1875, or it's the level today of very poor nations like Haiti, Somalia, and Botswana, hardly models of environmental rectitude. To give you an example of how radical a target this is, 
consider that the two industrialized nations with the lowest per capita greenhouse gas emissions today are France and Switzerland. France, as everyone knows, gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear power, while Switzerland gets nearly all of its electricity from nuclear or hydropower. Both forms of energy keep in mind that American environmentalists continue to oppose. And both countries are very compact, which means people there don't drive as far as Americans do. France's per capita greenhouse gas emissions are 6.5 metric tons per capita. Switzerland's are 6.1 tons per capita. To give you just one example of how difficult this is, it turns out that a current Toyota Prius, the favorite among hybrid car drivers today, gives off nearly two tons of CO2 if driven the average distance an American drives each year. That doesn't leave much room in your emissions budget for that flat screen TV you hung on the wall. When you start doing the math on American energy use, it becomes fairly clear fairly fast that achieving the 80 by 50 target will require nothing less than replacing the entire fossil fuel infrastructure of the nation within the space of little more than one generation. We're way beyond compact fluorescent light bulbs, better insulated houses and buildings, and hybrid cars. Even in the best case, with technologies not yet proven to be scalable to the needs of the nation, we're talking a multi-trillion dollar proposition, with costs the EPA estimates will reduce GDP by as much as 6% a year by the year 2030. And that, to use the favorite term of environmentalists, will prove to be unsustainable. Well, for more on this subject and other aspects of environmental trends, see the latest edition of the Index of Leading Environmental Indicators.